grasping the thin, almost translucent veil between that of fact and fiction, revealing mysteries of the past, folklore passed down from father to son, unsolved murders, and things that go bump in the night. You've entered Deceptive Reality. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Deceptive Reality Podcast. My name is Nick, and as usual, my co-host, the Bold Bert. Bold Bert, hey, listen, I know what that is, Nick. Listen, <laughs> it's, it, that, is a, that is a word that is four letters. I can't screw that one up very, I mean, I guess I could. I decided I I to throw that up. one out for you this week. Listen, hey, this one, I like it when it's easy, Nick. It's, it makes my life a whole lot easier. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you what, for the month of October, being my holiest of months, oh. I'll give you easy ones. Hey, I'll take it. Listen, we need as many softballs as we can get, Nick. Guaranteed. That's as many right. As we can get. For anyone that doesn't know, uh, on the YouTube lane, you're going to see double mic. Uh, double mic so I can hear myself. I, from that pin episode where I clicked the pin about 19,000 times. I want to hear what's going on on my side. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to see double Uh, mic. It's fine. Don't even worry about it. Let's just pretend like it didn't even happen. All right. Does that, does that not throw you off a little bit? To me, it does. The live feedback, live feedback. Oh God, no, dude. It's so much. I can't, it's hard for me to record without hearing myself. Ah, I think I scare myself. Here's what happens when I don't record or hear my voice in my ears because these are noise canceling headphones. Right. For one, I feel like I'm deaf because I can't tell what I'm looking around because I'm like, is that in my house or is that somewhere? (laughs) And then the second thing is I talk really loud, Nick. I get really loud with my talking because I don't know if I'm talking. (laughs) Yeah, I, I thought we were just both screaming the whole episode every time we do this. Yeah, that's kind of that. That's what we did. Now I can talk a little bit softer, and I can actually see that I've got some type of an imprint in audio without oh, visually okay. looking down at my monitors. So, yeah, without this, I can't. Uh, I can't function without it, Nick. I can't do okay, it. Okay, well, that's handy. So, this week, uh, last week, if you did not watch last week, last week we covered a humdinger. What was the name of that, Nick? What's it called again? It's got a weird the one name. We didn't. Yours. Uh, what was the name of yours? Oh, the Dyatlov Pass incident. I can't say that, folks. We need uh, someone okay. who can actually say that word. I can't say it. Now, I'm saying it with confidence, but I don't know if I'm saying it right. I think I am. But. Listen, our, listen, they don't know, Nick. They have zero clue if they're, if you're saying it right or not. They don't know. Well, so this fun. is the internet. So if I'm saying it wrong, someone's definitely going to tell me about it oh, in thousand detail. Percent. It's going to be in our podcast somewhere. <laughs> But last week when we was having that conversation, there was something that kept popping up and I'm like, I'm just going to do this next step. This was not what I had scheduled for this week. FYI, folks. Throwing me a curveball. I pushed this one ahead a little bit. Now, for anyone that doesn't know, I've got like five. Let me see. After this one, five more that I'm already researching. I've been researching. Wow. I was about 80% of the way done with this one. I had another one that's like 90% done. But I put this one ahead of it so it would match up with last week's a little bit. All right. I am confused and excited. This one, listen, this one is a humdinger. This one's going to take it. It's a story that everybody knows. I guarantee everybody knows. Okay. Okay. But I'm going to throw a -a spinneroonie on it. Hmm. I'm going to be embarrassed if I don't know it. I thought that it's impossible for you not to know this, Nick. Oh, no, you're just putting more pressure on top of me now. I would put $1,000 on the line that says there's no way that you don't know what this is. Okay. Okay. I, I feel better then. I feel better. It's a simple subject, but it's way more complex than people think it is. Okay. I like that kind of thing. Yes. Are you ready to see what it is, Nick? Yeah, I'm actually, I can't wait much longer. I need to know now. <laughs> now. <laughs> Let's go. Tonight, we delve into one of the most confusing phenomena that has captivated mankind for centuries. Mysterious circles in crops. They first showed up in Britain. Now, they're right here in Lethbridge. In fact, they're right in our backyard, so to speak. Some people will write off the rings as a hoax. But as Doug Voth reports tonight, 
They do raise eyebrows and warrant some serious investigation. Could it really happen in southern Alberta? Unexplained rings in fields of wheat, smack in the middle of Lethbridge. We've got quite a mystery in our hands here in Lethbridge, so... The discovery was made late Wednesday by farmer Hugh Laycock. Got started combining here yesterday afternoon. The first round, I was looking outside the field to make sure the edge was there and didn't notice things. Next time, it came around the right way, and here off to the right were these silly holes. So I, I don't know, gee, that looks like these things we've been reading about all the time. For decades, these perplexing patterns have appeared in fields across the globe, leaving us to wonder, are they elaborate hoaxes, messages from beyond, or perhaps even a language yet to be deciphered? Oh, you picked a contentious one this week. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hear about this on both sides, I guarantee it. <laughs> oh, man. If, if, I, if there's someone who's a thousand per ske- percent skeptic, if by the end of this, I don't make you go, there's something to this. I feel like I've not done my job. Well, you are in luck because okay. you've got someone right here to convince of this. Because I think this is bunk, bunk. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect, Nick. So <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you've never researched this for our podcast then. I have not. In fact, this is like, you know... You, with the Jersey Devil, you used to like switch the channel. Oh yeah! When I see crop c- circles, I'm always like, I don't want to watch this. <laughs> Just you wait, Nick. This one, I'm gonna tell you. This is something that's fascinated me since I was a kid. Really? So, so because you're all aboard for it then? There's no way that someone could tell me they're not. There's not something to them. Okay. Is it? That'd be like someone coming to me and saying, "There's no such thing as ghosts." There's no such thing right. as UFOs. There's no such right. thing as, you know, whatever. Okay. This to me now, we're going to take some twists and turns here, Nick. We're going to take some oh, twists and turns. I would expect no less. <laughs> but this one is a wild ride. Um, There is parts of it that I've added in a skepticism part. Okay. There's a lot of things that I, listen, when I started this research, because the first thing I thought is there's going to be a whole bunch of people that's going to say crop circles don't exist, which is fine. Right. I said, how can I make this as proven, tight, pulled with a bow, all together in a confined area as I can? When I was done researching, I had an hour and seven minutes of narration Oh my god. That goodness. I have cut down to 28 <laughs> minutes. Can you, for just the people listening who may not be familiar with this, what mm. does seven minutes of narration usually equate to in our podcast? Usually, okay, so here's an easier way to put it. Our typical okay. narration on a podcast that lasts between an hour and an hour and 20 minutes is about eight to ten minutes. Right. So, (laughs) an hour-long narration would be, what was it? You said, we'll say 10 minutes Mm -hmm. to be easy. Isn't like an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking half a day podcast. Pretty much. There's So, and the reason there's so much, there's so many cases... Right. Of crop circles. There's tens of thousands of cases of crop circles. Okay. Now, when but, you say crop circles, circles exist, are you saying there are things that happen or you're saying that they are things that aliens have caused? 100% aliens has caused. Okay. Okay. Just getting the, the ground rules for our, for our battle we're about to have. For those of you on the YouTube machine, you can see I dressed appropriately also for this. I love the shirts that you bring to the podcast, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it's oh. it's worth going to YouTube alone just for that. There was a, so <laughs> I've got a Bigfoot one. Mm-hmm. I've got a ghost one. I've got a UFO one. I've got another one that's on the way that is an alien and a Bigfoot. Oh, wow. Tag team. Yeah. So yeah, every week my goal is to have a different shirt that uh, has something to do with what we're doing. 
Oh, I, I feel so boring. I'm going to have to like get a little face tattoo for every thing we cover. <laughs> Nick's going to post Malone is bad boy. Well, that's that's right. That's right. So the crazy thing about the reason that that I had over an hour is because there's mm-hmm. complex things. And I've tried to dumb dumb it down as much as I can because a if right. you've not done a lot of research in any of this, you're not going to know what I'm talking about anyway. Mm. There's going to be things that's going to go back to an episode we talked about with Bob Lazar. Okay, yeah. Um, and there's going to be other things that I don't think any crop circle. Let me put it this way: there's episodes of different shows that talk about what's up with a crop circle. I don't think any of them has covered it as deeply as I'm about to. And I did okay. it in 28, 20, 23 minutes, 20, 21, 23, 20 something minutes, 23 minutes and 29 seconds. Okay. Of narration. Plus whatever we talk about after. Okay. All right. Well, that seems like a lot of information. Um, and it's dumbed down. I'm going to have to cover things that I'm going to try to put in layman's terms also. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to keep an open mind, but I am going into this as a non-believer. Oh, you don't need to even have an open mind, Nick. You don't. You, once, I don't know. once we're done, you're going to be like, "There's something to it." I can't not say that there's not. Okay, I'm an op- I'm open-minded to that as well, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm folding my arms in skepticism right now. <laughs> Perfect. Well, what I'm going to do is. Out of curiosity, when do you think the first cases of crop circles occurred? Do you remember? I don't, but let me say a guess of the 60s. The 60s would be a, a great guess. It's it's definitely a good guess. Do you want to find okay. out when the first... Uh, first, I'm going to take us to the first publicized possible confirmation of a crop circle. And then we're going to go really deep into history in the next segment. But do you want to see the first newspaper, not necessarily newspaper, but first article about crop circles? I do. Yeah. Also for uh, anyone that is on YouTube, you're going to see it. I'm going to put it for anyone that's not on YouTube on, and we say this every week, Facebook, Instagram, I'm going to throw these pictures up so you can see too. But we're going to obviously describe what we're talking about. But let's stop talking about it. Let's be about it. Let's go. All right. The year is 1678, and we find ourselves in Hertfordshire, England. It was a time of superstition and folklore, where mysteries were often said to be that of the supernatural or the divine. It was here that a curious incident was chronicled, one that many consider the first recorded account of a crop circle-like phenomenon. Captured in a pamphlet titled The Mowing Devil, or Strange News Out of Hertfordshire, the account speaks of a farmer embroiled in a disagreement over the price of mowing his field, Frustrated, the farmer declared he'd rather have the devil himself do the work than pay the laborer's asking price. Little did he know, his wish would be so darkly interpreted. Come morning, the field was not just mowed, it was transformed. Crops were laid down in such an intricate pattern that it defied human explanation, at least according to the standards of the 17th century. The farmer, along with the community, were convinced that this was no work of man but a demonic act, proof of the devil's handiwork on earth. So why does this centuries-old tale matter to us today? Because it shows us that the intrigue surrounding crop circles isn't just a product of modern curiosity. It's a thread woven into the very fabric of human history, one that compels us to seek answers, even when those answers elude us. Oh, I was way off. <laughs> way <laughs> off. There was, well, there was a six in there, so I guess I got that. There bit. was a six. There was, you had that. In your Isn't there a song one out of four ain't bad. <laughs> that, listen, hey, that one was a trick question. Ah, uh, well, this was there the devil's was, doing. So correct. This is the devil. Listen, the devil's <laughs> in a UFO. We all know this. This is standard stuff. This is um, standard reading, Nick. There is a folder that I sent you, Nick. Okay. Inside that folder, there is a one. And that's going to be the first photo. And what that is, that is the actual article. It's very hard to read because, again, this is a really old print. 
is is this old English in here that I'm seeing? Uh, it's yeah. There's a lot of words used that we don't use now. Yeah, I see this. The first thing I know is is Hartford hyphen, and it looks like F H I R E. I think that's old English. Yes. So wow. this is a case where a guy's basically ticked off. He's ticked off. He wants to get his his. And of course, the way they described it is he wanted to get his, uh, how did they phrase it? They said, uh, field. I don't think they used the terminology, the field in that. I think they did mowing his field. So long story short, he's frustrated because he's like, these prices is too high. <laughs> Wish if he was here, <laughs> he'd change his opinion right. and be like, ah, God. but he basically is like, all right, let the devil do it himself before I pay that much money. I can only assume he's an old guy with a pitchfork. That's the way I would assume this story to go. Yeah, that's a lot like the Mother Leads thing where she's like, if this is going to be a, if I'm going to have this 13th kid, let's make it a devil kind of thing. You get what you the wish for. Devils came up twice in two weeks. Oh, Nick. yeah. Yeah, I think that was what they, when we don't know things now, it's like UFOs. Before that, it was probably fairies or devils. So I think that's the shift in the times. Oh, for sure. And that's exactly what they was talking about in that narration is Mm. this is a day and time when UFOs wasn't a thing. It was, there was no little green men. There was no aliens. This was the devil, dude. The devil's in the work. You can only explain things in the context of what you know. So correct. A hundred percent. And this is definitely one of those cases. So he goes to bed. He wakes up the next morning. And he looks out and he's confused. Now, they didn't go into the fact that it was a circle. We don't know that it was a circle. But it said the crop was laying down. The picture in the article seemed to suggest it was a circle. It suggested but it didn't say that's true. That is true. And it, it this is why I'm bringing it here. Listen, illustrations, illustrations back then may not have been. Now I would assume to be correct. Right. Bert only goes the, down the center on this. When I say <laughs> this is Bert speculation, then I pull right. it and I go a little bit left to center. But right now we don't know that it's a circle illustration no. shows. It could be a circle, but we don't know. The devil's terrible at mowing. The devil is not a great mower. He just knocked it all down. (laughs) (laughs) He did too. Now this is 1678. Right. So we went back a ways for a Mm -hmm. potential. Now, again, we didn't know this, these as crop circles back then. We just said, look at this crazy phenomena that the devil did. Right. What if I told you, we could go back further in time. I would definitely be curious about that. And is it the devil? So here's the thing. There's a lot that it's assumed. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this also that crop circles are products of UFOs. But a long time ago, there was, you guys have to understand Mm -hmm. There was no definitive concept of there even being another civilization with people that fly around in these machines. So a lot of the terminology you're going to hear, you're going to be like, uh, that must be a UFO, but they don't know what a UFO is yet. Are you ready Mm -hmm. to hear it, Nick? Yeah, let's hear it. You're going to want to listen to these dates. Okay, I'm going to write them. I got my trusty notepad. While the United Kingdom serves as the modern epicenter for crop circles, it's important to note that these mysterious formations are not restricted by time or geography. These mysterious imprints that have dotted the landscapes of human history, inviting wonder and speculation for centuries. Take, for instance, the 9th century in France. Abigard, the Bishop of Lyon, chronicled tales of parishioners engaged in rituals that eerily mirror the crop circle phenomena. Seeds collected from flattened circles and fields were employed for fertility rites, possibly rooted in paganism or even what was considered devil worship. 
Fast forward to 1686, when Robert Plot, a learned professor at Oxford, didn't just write about crop circles, but even sketched them. He spoke of flashes of light and an unsettling aversion animals seemed to have for these formations. Intriguingly, around the same period, a pamphlet named The Mowing Devil surfaced, rekindling the narrative that these designs could not be the work of mortal hands. Even in the archives of royal history, John Leland, librarian to Henry VIII, recounted strange patterns appearing overnight in grasslands, and as we move further into the 20th century, documented instances become more frequent and diverse. A British science journal in 1937, a U.S. Air Force investigation in Kansas in 1952, and a detailed study by astronomer Sir Patrick Moore in 1963. So, we went all the way back, Nick, all the way back to the 9th century. I, I have, that. oh yeah, I've got that ninth century um, flattened fields. They collected seeds from them for rituals. Yes. Fertility rituals. Um, then we have 1686 where they describe flashes of light and animals having adverse feelings towards these locations. Correct. And I put a little star next to that. And I don't know if I'm going, jumping too far ahead, but. I'd wonder, do animals still have aversions to crop circles? Do it's not know? covered in the narration. And there's two camps on this. Okay. This is merely speculation. And the reason I say speculation is because there's no scientific proof of this. Right. What a lot of researchers, and this is why I'm prefacing this the way that I am. They say that animals do not go into these areas for long periods of time. I believe that it's true based on something we're going to talk about in the future. Okay. But there's no scientific there. I don't know that there is a way that scientifically, well, that's not true. Like if you go to Chernobyl right now and you see yeah. animals, you can technically look at the animals and go, okay, this has occurred due to X, Y, and Z. Right. This one though, is it such a small populace of area or should I say segment of an area? I think it would be much harder to know for sure. I'd be more interested in if you like led an animal there, if they'd be anxious to get away or not. Just like note the behavior of the animal. So they've not done research that I know of with animals, but they have with right. humans. Oh, uh, interesting. That we're going to go into that's very different. Now, we did all of these in the histories. And again, there's not really anything that makes you point your finger and go, wow, that's kind of cool. There is on number two folder, Nick, the oh, illustration. Are you ready for two? Yep. The illustration that Robert Platt created. So you can understand what he was looking at, which was basically almost, he showed it as a circle. And of course, he talked about it also. So he illust illustrated what he saw. Uh, I see the circle and the square part, but I'm a little confused about what he's got coming out of the clouds there. I think what he was trying to create was what he deemed as what he thinks created it. Okay. It looks like a key to me is what it looks like. Yeah, it looks like that to me too. And I'm wondering if it's just like he saw one perspective of it and tried to imagine what it looked like and maybe he was just like way off. Could be. Could, Could very be. well be. Okay. So these are obviously documented accounts. So for anyone that's still skeptical, they're like, okay, whatever. You know, this, anyone can write about anything. There's so many different things yeah. you can write about and there's not necessarily proof of it. I want to start getting into the meat and the potatoes. Okay. Things that's a little bit more tangible, things that's a little bit more proven. We've not seen any photos of any crop circles. We've not talked deep about any crop circles. We've not done any of that. I'm going to take us to what I consider is probably the first great proof of not even a, a, the crop circle, but what created the crop circle. Okay. And I think that's going to stem off our, our story as we go. We're going to be able to kind of branch off of that a little bit and you'll have more questions. Are you ready to hear what I consider the best first documented proof? Yes. Yeah. Win me over. 
we move forward to 1966 and the place is Tully, Queensland, Australia. In this far off corner of the world, a singular event transpired that would shake the very foundations of our understanding of crop circles. George Pedley, a local sugar cane farmer, was going about his usual tasks when he witnessed something extraordinary. At approximately 9 a.m., Pedley reported hearing a hissing sound, followed by a saucer-like object rising from a swamp and disappearing into the sky. When George Pedley reported what he had seen and what was left behind. This nest of flattened reeds, it was more than just a tale told over a few beers at the local pub. This was a phenomenon that prompted immediate investigation, drawing attention from the media, UFO enthusiasts, and even scientists. Physical inspections of the site revealed something intriguing. The reeds were not broken, they were bent. The clear, clockwise swirling pattern in the reeds indicated that whatever had caused this formation was highly localized and extraordinarily forceful. The circle was a large, roughly circular area where the water reeds were flattened in a clockwise swirling pattern. The area of the formation was reported to be about 32 feet in diameter. In the months that followed, increased reports of diminished water levels in the swamp also piqued interest. Some theorized that the saucer-like object Pedley described might have been extracting water for an unknown purpose, a theory that remains speculative but fascinating. The Australian government took note of the event. No definitive evidence could be gleaned to prove or disprove Pedley's account. Perhaps the most enduring outcome of the Tully Saucer Nest investigation was its impact on public consciousness. Here was a case with an eyewitness, a physical trace left behind, and the interest of government bodies. While it didn't provide answers, it offered something almost as valuable legitimacy to the questions. The Tully case reminded us that mysteries exist not just in tales from centuries past, but in our own backyards and within our lifetimes. All right. Yes. I can see why you'd say this is a big one, and it's got me some questions. Before you ask questions, folder right. three is going to be everything on this specific situation. And again, for the, the people listening and they can't see, I'm going to put, once this bad boy airs, there's about six different things. There's one newspaper article that just talks about it. No hoax, says the farmers. Then I've got three different photos of that specific circle. Now, it's only 32 feet across when they measured it, it's 32 feet. But I also gave a diagram of where uh -huh. it sat and where it made it interesting in reference to the land that it was on. And then there's our last photo of just the basically investigators and the main guy that found it totally out looking at the actual crop. Okay. So are you ready for a couple questions? Yes. All right. Um, uh, there's something that I have questions about and something that I'm really interested in from okay. a scientific point of view. So the first mm -hmm. part is the bent reeds. Mm -hmm. So I, ha I haven't spent much time in hay fields or wheat fields or anything. So mm -hmm. if I went out there and I walked through the wheat, could I bend it if I was careful or would I be breaking it when I stepped through? It depends on where in the process the weed is at. Okay. Technically what happens, and I think we cover this in the narration at some point, but what happens is as the wheat grows, there's, there's like a, the top part, I forget what they right. call, where all the seeds are. It sprouts straight up. And then as time progresses, it bends. Okay. By itself. It's just the right. gravity, the seeds that pulls it down. There's something very unique that happens when these crop circles come up, and I'm going to wait to see if it explains it in the narration a little bit later. But if okay. you walked through a wheat field, just not paying attention, you would break the stalk. Okay. So, so what if I drag something? Like if I had a little heavy sledge or something, would I be breaking it then, or might it bend it then also? It depends. And okay. by that, it depends on how much weight you're creating. Okay. So See, I'm just coming up with different ways that I could do this. this thousand percent. We're going to cover a lot of these yeah. ways. Okay. We're going to cover okay. it because 
we got a very interesting segment that I'm going to laugh a little bit at. Oh, okay. Because I find it funny. <laughs> um, no spoilers. You're you're going to want to check that part out. That So here's one of the things you got to look at. If, if you're trying to create the illusion of making these circles, right? Very simplistic circles. You have to remember if you're, if you have, let's use, for example, like a pipe or a board or right. something and you stand to push it down, you're creating two things. You're a, you're creating a, at least one footprint. Right. Right. But two, you're still putting your entire weight mostly on that board. So you're still in some regards going to be breaking or damaging the stock. Yeah. And that's sort of what I was trying to get to. If that kind of thing would cause it to break. Because it's if it's a bend, that, that's way more difficult to do in my mind. For sure. For okay. sure. Okay. Absolutely. And there's been many, many crop circles found where the, um, whatever the crop is, the stock was broken. Right. So that, that would be a lot easier to hoax than like bending them, I would think. Oh yeah. We, yeah. You can think, you can think this all you want to Nick. When we get to a certain segment, you're going to be like, okay, that I don't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, is there like some kind of rock in the center of it or something in these pictures? It's kind of hard to. So I saw that and it didn't really explain what that was. Okay. Is it in uh, the very center of the swirl? It is, but at least the way it looks, it is. I don't know what that is. So I didn't bring it up and nothing that I could see explained what that was. Yeah. And sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. So I'm thinking Correct. it's just something they used to measure or maybe. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I can't okay. answer that. All right, that's fine. Cause like I, I know in like 50% of the photos, it's just not there. Correct. Yeah. Um, so I think they brought that and put it there, maybe for scale or for something. The other thing that I wanted to gloss over a bit is it's interesting about the water levels. Mm -hmm. Um that that's something that Man, I I know we don't we wouldn't have it, but I'd like to see like does that happen frequently there or is this something that's just never happened before and all of a sudden it happened? Like, I'd be interested in the history on that. It's from each of these stories I'm getting like one piece of an interesting <laughs> test we could do. This is so, so cute. So when you have kids you know, you watch them, they start crawling and you're like, oh, look at him, they're crawling. He was just, right. he's laying on his back just a minute ago. <laughs> then you watch them, then they start trying to take their first, first footsteps. You are in the crawling stage right now, Nick. And it's I'm so cute. I'm in the cute. crawling stage. It's, it's adorable because. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> here in a little bit, you're going to be like, I don't care about none of that. None of that uh. even. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is why you got to, you got to research crop circles, Nick. This is important stuff. We'll, we'll see. I don't know. Still not convinced. I'm curious, but not convinced. There, the interesting part of this story is a, and I think this is why I feel the way that I feel about this story. Mm -hmm. Somebody saw it happen. Correction. Right. They saw a bright light. It was in their field and they went, mm -hmm. what is that? They went to check it out. And then the area where the thing came from, there was now this crop circle. But they also took note, well, all this water is gone. Why is the water gone? Yeah. So we always talk about it. I want there to be proof that somebody saw what it is that they're, that, that's going on. But number right. two, I want to know what happened. But the problem is, again, crop circles were not huge. This is 1974. They were happening. Right. But they were sporadic at best. Or actually, this was in, what, 1950, hold on, 1966. And it's in Australia. Right. Of all the, the vast majority of UFO cases are in the UK. The vast majority. More fields, I, would I guess, assume. <laughs> do what? More fields in the UK. Like, 
after World War II, they had to switch entirely to crops. Yeah, no, there's something very significant about the UK we're going to cover in the future. Okay. Like now, significant. If, now, I'll say this. Most of the time we hear about crop circles. It's just like, here's a crop circle. It's pretty crazy this happens, and that's it. If more oh, of yeah. these stories come along with possible explanations of why, that would go a long way for me. Oh, yeah. No, at the end of this thing, Nick, you're going to be full on walking. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Feed me a little I'm more. Going, Build my strength go- to walk. <laughs> I'm going to push your mindset to a very weird place. Now, oh, we've boy. talked about so far the circles. Yeah. And we've talked about, listen, they're very simplistic circles. There was a major event that we're going to go to that's going to happen. I'm going to have to fast forward the story because otherwise if I split the two up, you're not, you're going to remember, you're going to be like, this was forever ago in the story. So I'm going to take us in the future or in the past. Okay. Then bring us to the future to, to bring two things together. This is is Doc Brown going to show up and uh, help us out here? Or? Yes, where All we're right. going, there is no roads, Nick. Eighty-eight miles per hour, take me there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here you go, Nick. This, 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 woo, this one's a deep one. All right. In 1974, humankind sent out a cosmic greeting card of sorts, a binary message beamed from the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, led by Dr. Frank Drake and aided by Carl Sagan. This ambitious project aimed to reach potential extraterrestrial civilizations, painting a rudimentary picture of life on Earth. Fast forward to August 2001. A perplexing crop formation appears right beside the Chilbolton Radio Telescope in the United Kingdom. From the ground, it looked chaotic, unstructured, nothing like the geometrically pleasing formations we're used to. However, when viewed from the sky, an intricate pattern emerged, a face, to be precise, followed by a series of intricate designs. Upon closer inspection, this formation was found to be reminiscent of the Arecibo message, right down to the 23 by 7 73 grid, dubbed the Arecibo answer. This response showed startling differences. Unlike the Earth's carbon-based life, the depicted life form was silicon-based with a third strand in their DNA. With a staggering population of 21 billion, these beings seemed to inhabit multiple celestial bodies. Beneath this cryptic response was another formation resembling a piece of complex machinery. Could this be their version of a radio telescope, a clue to their advanced communication technologies? If the Arecibo answer left you questioning the boundaries between science and phenomenon. The next development would blur those lines even further. Just when the world was coming to terms with the possibility of a cosmic conversation, a new formation emerged. Unlike previous designs, this one incorporated something unprecedented, binary code inscribed within the very patterns of the crop. For the tech savvy among us, binary code is the basic language of computers, consisting of zeros and ones. But what does it mean when such a language appears in a field, intricately woven into the stalks of wheat? Analysis of this disk formation revealed a string of binary code that, when translated, delivered a message. But like any mystery worth its salt, the meaning of the message is subject to interpretation. For some, it was a mysterious clue. For others, a sign that we may be dealing with an intelligence that understands our technology. Technologies. When translated from standard 8-bit binary code, the message reads, Be aware of false gifts, their broken promises, much pain, but still time. Believe, there is good out there. We oppose deception. Boy, I want to do a whole string of swears right now. Because <laughs> that was big. That blew my mind, right? So... We're going to have to look, you're going to have to look at two separate folders here. And I screwed it up a little bit. Folder four is the Arecibo message that we sent out and what was received back. Wow. If you look at ours and Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually, again, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, there's one that says main uh, Q. I M P I N G. Yeah. When, when you place 
our message with their message Mm -hmm. at the very top, the very first dots you see is basically our version of going, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so that they understand how to decipher the message. Then there's a, a symbol at the top and it basically talks about carbon. So the purple is the carbon they're saying. Okay. Carbon is our main form for our life. Mm-hmm. Then the rest of it is the other elements that go into it. Then we put our DNA showing our strands of DNA. Yeah. I'm familiar with that. We one. show that we're an average of five foot tall, I believe right. is what we put. It's either five or six foot tall. Okay. Then we put our population size, but in between us. And the population or after the population size, we put from left to right, the stars in our system. And we upticked the one that's the third one showing that we're the third one from the star. Okay. Below that, we put basically our concept of this is how we, we sent this out. Now this went out in 1974. Okay. In 2001, this Arecibo answer was received back right beside one of those communication towers. How how close are we talking? Do we know? Close to what? The tower. The tower that sent it? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I did. I don't know that one. Is that tower typically manned? Like there are other people there most of the time. Also don't know that. Okay. I would think yes. I'm going to presume yes. Well, that's what's interesting about this. So this crop circle fit the exact dimensions of what we sent out on a grandiose right. scale. And I see the pictures this is incredibly complex. I wouldn't know where to start to fake that. Yeah. And if you look, there's a picture of the face mm-hmm. that they found in the crop circle, which also... If you look at that picture of that face, what's the first thing you think of when you see that, Nick? Uh, well, I, I think that looks more like us, really, though. Is that supposed so, to be them? So, interestingly enough, I'm the only one that sees this, and this mm-hmm. could be just a case of, you know, me thinking I see something that's not really right. there. Remember when we found that face? On Mars? On Mars? Yeah. Does that does that not look like the face that was on Mars? It it does. I don't I don't know if I want to relate it to that because that turned out to be like a weird shadow, though, didn't it? That's what they say. That's mm. what they say. And they gave us another view that did not look the same. But it's whatever. Right. We don't have to say that. But I'm saying the yeah. first picture did it not remind you kind of what that looked like. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I can see that. Yeah. So very similar. So when we received this, I'm going to call it a message. Mm -hmm. When we received it back, they did the same one through 10, like we did. Right. But instead of carbon, they made theirs silicone. Right. Or silicon as their, as their dominant. And then they gave the rest of the DNA code. And if you look the, or the uh, rest of the uh, stuff create to create them, mm-hmm. it's the same as ours. The only difference is the main element. Right. They send back that they don't have two strands of DNA. They have three. Interesting. Instead of being our height, they said they're four foot tall. Okay. Does that strike any thought process for you, Nick? With the with the little green men thing, the Hopkinsville goblins is no, what I thought about. <laughs> Bob Lazar said those UFOs fit what size? Yeah, small ceilings, three to four foot tall yeah. creations. That would be what that is. See, they going off on like a. The, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you look, they inhibit the third fourth and fifth planet in their solar systems. So they've expanded quite a bit, which makes sense. Yes. 
Now the height difference yes. thing, I wanted to bring up this. Mm-hmm. Um, generally speaking, through the evolution of people, we are also, as we go along, getting smaller in some cases. Yes. Now, I don't know if that's overall everywhere, but I think that's that could be like a a species like farther along than we are, which is definitely what they are. Very well could be. But what would a silicone based life form even look like? Would we expect it to be humanoid shaped? I don't even know. I don't even yeah. know. And what's weird is if you look, if you look at their, their illustration, our head really small in proportion with the rest of their body, mm-hmm. their head extremely large versus right. the proportion of their body, which right. again, but some people's going to say, well, of course, if you're going to create this illustration, you're going to give yourself a big head because that's what everyone says. Mm. Were they UFO saying supposed that, to look like? Uh, well, in 2001, that's different. I was thinking mm-hmm. like earlier, so people would have been saying that at the time. Correct. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. I like how they added that they've inhabited three planets. I like that they said they're silicon based. The height thing matches for me. The complexity of the quote unquote crop circle does a lot for me. Yes. There's a lot to this. There really yeah. is. So, uh, oh, the other part is you talked about they did an illustration of a complex device. Is is that so, or did I mishear that? Uh, so there was another one that I'm. It's in folder six. Okay. So we we're skipping five, going to six. Right. This is what was found in a oh. field. <laughs> now, what makes this impressive? Mm-hmm. If for anyone that doesn't remember, there used to be a day and age when you could take an Oki Data printer and make images, they created what almost looks like an ET extraterrestrial, but the movie ET and beside it was a circle with a design that's technically ASCII, which is a binary code Mm. that we used. And that binary code in that circle is what was read off. Okay. Interesting. And for anyone that doesn't remember, the binary code was be aware of false gifts, their broken promises, much pain, but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose deception. Mm. That is interesting. But think about it. And I'm just... Can someone make a crop circle? Yes. Is a bunch of computer nerds making crop circles? I don't know about that. To the point to where you're creating binary code and crops. Mm. I I have no doubt that someone could come up with that. It's the execution which makes me think it's extraordinary. Because the size of these, the amount of time it would have taken, um clearly not a single person could be out there doing that on their own no, and not no be way. noticed at all. Like, and I on feel top like of these that, have to be sudden. Oh, for, yeah. But think about this. D- d- stop for just a second. You're in pitch dark at nighttime. Right. Hiding Simply impossible. Everybody. Oh, yeah. You, you couldn't say, do this at night without lights. No way. It's impossible. <laughs> But think about it. You're going through crops that's as tall as you. Right. In some occasions. So you're telling me you're able to, without going up in the air to make sure you're in the right position, creating Mm. these things? For three weeks straight without being noticed next to a probably manned telescope. Which, by the way, now that I've had a little more time to think about it, it probably was at that time manned because uh, SETI eventually had to switch from using 
and manning the telescopes to save money to have people processing the stuff on their own computers. So I think at the time, at 2001, they probably would have been manned because they still had the budget for that. So to do that right next door had to be in the daytime, otherwise people would have seen the lights, had to be quickly, couldn't have been unnoticed if it was going on for weeks and weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. Scientists fly in and out of these places all the time. Like, okay, okay, I think you're getting me a little bit here. I think you're getting me a little bit here. We're getting to good stuff. We haven't even got to the best stuff, Nick. Yeah. See, I've never seen these complexities. Yeah. I've just seen the because you're like me. Stupid symbols. You turned off the show too soon, Nick. You it's turned off exactly the show too right. soon. It's exactly this right. exactly This is why you don't turn off any show. I'm never turning off another freaking Jersey Devil episode. You're never going to turn off another nope. crop circle one. I'm not going to turn off an episode of anything unless country music's playing. <laughs> I have some oh, standards man. I can't break. <laughs> Jeezy Pete's. God. Well, yeah, this is amazing. I, I could have swore, though, in one part of it, they said there was something that they couldn't identify that looked like machinery or something that they were trying to explain. So that's yeah. not uncommon in these crop circles. Okay. It we're going to hear that more than once. Yeah. Has, so, have you read? In anything fact, by we're going to go Sagan? down. A, do what? Have you read anything by Carl Sagan? Yes. Have you read Contact? No. Because it sounds a lot like he based it off of this. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It's one of the best things I've ever read. And the movie, I think there's a movie is pretty good, but the book is fantastic. The only thing I've read on his is there was a book that was on basically the development of our space program. I forget what the name of the book was, but it basically went into the concepts to extend to the next level of space exploration. Okay. He talked about a lot of the radiation fields, Mm -hmm. some of the problems with once we get too far out of our system is more of like a science based book. Yeah. Very dry, but very interesting if you're into that kind of thing. So far as I know, the book Contact, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, was the only science fiction he ever wrote. But it was brilliant. See, it's just like uh the, the Jersey Devil. I clicked off, Nick. Yep. I'm like fiction. We only want the real stuff around her. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I shouldn't have clicked off of these. Actually, I think I was just catching like sensationalist news clips that just show these weird designs and not really show anything behind it. Like I've never seen any of this and this is fantastic. Well, as much as I've got you believing, Nick, I'm probably going to kill it for you just a little bit. Uh, Don't kill my hope. Are you the great (laughs) deceiver that they're telling me about? (laughs) Could be the great deceiver, brother. We're about to, uh, I'm about to explain to you probably what's occurring the vast majority of the time. Okay. All right. I I can take it. Just when you thought you determined that crop circles had to be from an advanced civilization, along come two Englishmen armed with simple tools and a mischievous sense of humor to throw a wrench into the whole saga. Meet Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley. In 1991, they stepped forward to claim responsibility for many of the crop circles that had captivated the world. Their interest had been aroused by an article in this morning's Today newspaper. At long last, there would be proof of earthly involvement. Two men in their 60s from Southampton had been making circles for years, and they would show how it was done. Armed with nothing more than wooden planks, ropes, and a dash of creativity, they demonstrated how they'd been flattening wheat and barley in the dead of night. Their confession and demonstration shook the crop circle community. What was once believed to be the work of extraterrestrial beings or unknown natural phenomena now had a decidedly human twist. (laughs) These guys. I I think I'd seen something about this. Yeah, they had boards. Literally to everything boards with rope on each end of it that they had in their hands and they were see that's sort of what I was getting yes. at earlier but I here's s- what I don't I don't here's, believe this <laughs> here's what's important Nick mm-hmm. 
they was able to explain that some of the more impressive ones they created and they did it in a way that didn't necessarily always hurt the stock. Mm. And they even took the time to, once the reporters came in to show them exactly how they did it. And in fact, they said, can you recreate some of these things for us? Right. And they could. We're going to go into it. That's the next segment. We're going to go oh, okay. into, they basically took their hardest works and then their goal was to recreate it for the, the reporters and stuff. I feel like I'm on a roller coaster of emotions right now. I don't want to be let down. We tell both sides of the story. Nick. <laughs> no, not we this time. Stop it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> what I'd like to do is let them demonstrate exactly how they did it. That way we can say at least a huge chunk of these are fake. Right. Right. Which I think is to be expected. I'm not really that upset about that. It's only fair. So yeah. let's stop talking about let's Let's see how they created all this stuff. Okay. Just when it seemed like Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley had the final word on crop circles, cracks began to appear in their tail as more people examined their claims and watched their demonstrations. Discrepancies bubbled to the surface. Firstly, there was the issue of precision, or rather, the lack of it. When attempting to replicate some of their masterpieces for news crews, the results were less than stellar. Dave's formations were consistently misaligned. In one instance, Doug attempted to recreate one of his famous circles, only to end up with a formation twice the size of the original. Frustrated, he simply gave up. But that wasn't all. Their story seemed to shift like sand underfoot. Initially, they claimed to have started their nighttime adventures in 1976. Then, it was 1975, and later, 1978. The inconsistencies didn't end there. They even contradicted themselves about specific formations they claimed to have created. Perhaps the most puzzling of all was their explanation of the famous 1983 Cheesefoot Head Circle. Doug provided a diagram to explain their involvement, but the diagram included footpaths something conspicuously absent in the actual formation. When questioned on how they managed to enter the field without leaving tracks, Doug offered an eyebrow-raising explanation. They had pole vaulted in. I'm deliberately repeating that. Doug said, and I quote, we had pole vaulted in. <laughs> All right. Forget these guys. These guys are trash. I don't care about them. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh so, my goodness. Whenever we talk about crop circles, I'm crying. Whenever we talk about crop circles, these two names come up all the time and they go, This is our proof that these crop circles don't exist. Is Doug what, what are Bauer, their names again? Doug Bauer. Doug Bauer. <laughs> and Dave Chorley. They still around? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I laugh every time someone brings their names up when I talk about crop circles, though. So these guys were. (laughs) (laughs) Underline, underline. (laughs) These guys were 65, 60, 65. So. They come out and they, they, the, there's this crop circles that kind of became the thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they, they come out to the news. They're like, listen, you guys are a bunch of idiots. We've been making these for years. You guys fell right into our plans. So the news is like, okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Prove it. Yeah. No problem. Listen, we got this board. And like you said, it was the demonstration. Mm-hmm. That's what everyone remembers. Yep. And some news agencies like, well, I mean, they did make a crop circle technically. When they went to the more complex ones, which are the things you're amazed right, by. Right, right. They either made them too big. They made them too small. They were misaligned. And like they said, at one point in time, he was trying to create a crop circle and he got so ticked off. He's like, I'm done. Like, I'm. Yeah. And that one was just a circle. Have, have you ever seen a crop circle halfway made just gave up on? No. Or misaligned? No. no. <laughs> but my favorite part is they're, they're going back to try to look and recreate this famous one that they took credit for. And they're like, 
It was by far the most complex. It was the cheese foot head circle. Right. They tell how they did it. And they said, well, you have these paths here. Like the paths didn't really exist. And you see them, they go, we use pole vaults. These are 60 some year old men. Right. You pole vaulted into the field. (laughs) People still consider these guys as the reason for why crop circles are fake. This guy's a dumb. Uh, (laughs) I, you know what I would have been done if I was the, I was the news guys. I'd be like, okay, here's a pole vault. Show me. Show us. Because I don't know if you've ever seen people pole vaulting. Oh, yeah. But you don't get to land on your feet on the other side. No. You land on big mats. So these old men are pole vaulting into a field, flopping down on the hard ground on their side. Correct. No. And then doing it back out again. Correct. Bull poopies. The reason I want, I didn't even want to put this part in here, but I'm like, there's so many skeptics that refer back to what they say. These are, and I'm like, I've got to bring it up because it's whenever someone talks about crop circles, those names always come up. And I don't understand why, because they've been disproven so many different ways. You know, I'm going to call these guys. What? Owl boys. These are freaking (laughs) owl boys. The dog on uh, owl boys, man. Yeah, these are the That's kind of funny. guys like, you know, it, it was owls and pole vaults and all that. They can't even demonstrate a circle in broad daylight because I know they didn't film in the nighttime. Well, they were misaligned. They was misaligned yeah. every single time, darn near, that they tried to recreate these. And it was never the things that they said they were capable mm. of doing. They could never regenerate correctly. I have now, never seen a news story. Where they're like, mm-hmm. this just in, a farmer finds a circle in his field. The circle's garbage and misaligned and out of shape. Um, you know. But it brings up a very valid question, which is, how do you know a real crop circle from, and let's, let's be realistic. Many crop circles have been faked. Mm-hmm. Many have been faked. I have no doubt about that. How do you know what's real and what's fake? Look for that- 40 foot poles. <laughs> that is that is one way to do it, Nick. You see some 40-foot poles, you go, there's a 60-year-old jumping in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this next segment goes into how to know the difference between what we deem as a real one and one that's man-made. Now, some of the questions that you asked mm-hmm. is going to be in this segment. Okay. And you're good. going to hear things where literally you're going to go, what? <laughs> I've already been doing that, so I, I guess I'm prepared now. This is now. how you know. This is literally how you know, real from fake, and it's okay. about to blow your mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. So, how does one separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, when it comes to crop circles? While skeptics and believers spar over the origins of these fascinating formations, there are some criteria that researchers often cite in attempts to validate the authenticity of a crop circle. First, let's consider the complexity of the design. Genuine crop circles often feature intricate geometric patterns that would be difficult to fabricate in the cover of night, especially without being detected. Some of these patterns include fractals and shapes that have roots in ancient symbology, details not easily crafted on a whim. Another point to ponder is the condition of the crops themselves. In many so-called authentic circles, the crops are not merely flattened, they appear to be bent at the nodes. Some argue that this phenomenon suggests the involvement of a mysterious energy source, a force that human hoaxers would find difficult to replicate. Then there's the matter of electromagnetic anomalies. Various reports indicate the presence of unusual electrical activity within genuine crop circles. From malfunctioning electronic devices to inexplicable magnetic fields, these oddities add another layer of mystique to the phenomenon. As we delve further into the mystery of crop circles, an interesting question crops up. No pun intended. Do the flattened plants continue to grow after the formation appears? You might be surprised at the answer. Against all odds, 
seeds. In many instances, these crops don't wither and die but continue to grow, though mysteriously horizontal rather than towards the sky. This phenomenon contradicts what one would expect from mechanically flattened crops, which typically suffer damage that stunts their growth. Scientists studying this have been puzzled. Some speculate that the method of flattening, especially in circles believed to be authentic, might be less damaging than we think. Instead of being crushed, the stalks are often bent, allowing the plant to continue its natural growth process even if in an altered direction. This resilience of the crops adds yet another layer to the mystique surrounding crop circles. But what about the plants caught in these curious designs? Do they exhibit any differences in growth, seeds, or other characteristics? What does the science say? Research has been conducted on this very subject. Some studies suggest that plants within crop circles sometimes show alterations in their cellular structure. Remarkably, these changes don't seem to correspond with what you would expect from mechanical damage or crushing. Instead, they often appear more subtle, almost as if altered by an unknown energy. Intriguingly, some farmers have reported that seeds harvested from these formations have displayed different germination rates. Some suggest faster germination, others slower, depending on the formation and the crop in question. Interesting. The very last part in particular. The Correct. Ancient people made that connection somehow on their own. Correct. Oh, uh, that's big. I was hoping you would, you would acknowledge that part. Oh, yeah, I latched so, right on to that. <laughs> There was a story from the past when obviously they thought it was some form of a, almost like devil worship. Mm. And they said, they're using these seeds from these circular crop patterns. And it was almost, it was frowned upon because they saw it as like devil worship stuff. Right. But if you look at it, in a lot of these cases, these seeds are performing better than other seeds. Right. Right. Yeah. And they, and they could tell. Correct. Yeah. Another fascinating part, um, bent at the nodes. Mm -hmm. That would be impossible to do with the board with ropes on it. That's for sure. Correct. It, so this almost seems like altering its DNA kind of. Oh yeah. For sure. So for anyone that doesn't know, that's not been around crops. Nodes would be similar to like our knuckles in our hands. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Plants are going to have these nodes and we're going to go into how they bend or what's theorized of how they bend um, in the future. So there are some other elements that we've not quite gotten into yet that makes you shake your head and go, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, but they're bending at that node, but because it's bending at the node and it's not doing damage to the actual crop they're continuing to grow much like they would normally mm -hmm. the difference is they're growing horizontally or or with the ground versus away from the ground and here's a fun fact for people if you were to bend a stock the node would be the stronger part not the weak part weaker part correct so it would be more difficult to do that without damaging the rest of the stock so that's fascinating correct. Oh, it's definitely interesting because it doesn't make any sense with all the theories of how these crop circles were created. It's very hard. I think it's impossible for anyone to do that because they's like, well, maybe they did this or that. There's only really one way that, that I know that we know of that that can happen. Mm. We use it every day. We do it every day. And we don't even acknowledge that we're doing it. And that's covered in the next segment. Okay. Let me hear that because I have no idea what you're talking about right now. And I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's advance on. Biophysicist William Levingood stepped into this mystery in the 1990s, examining plants taken from crop circles. What he found puzzled even the skeptics. The apical nodes, the knuckles of the wheat stalks, were not just elongated, they were ruptured, creating what is called an expulsion cavity. This phenomenon is similar to how a microwave oven works by heating water inside the food. Imagine, if you will, the water within the wheat stalk node superheating, turning to steam and causing the nodes to burst. But who or what is setting this microwave? 
The question lingers like mist over a newly formed crop circle. And speaking of mist, witnesses often report a fine mist hanging above these formations, which some researchers believe is steam released from the heated plants. Coincidence, perhaps, but then there's the matter of seeds harvested from these areas growing at an accelerated rate, rich in protein, compared to those outside the circle. And what about the magnetized iron particles found at the scene? Particles consistent with meteorite iron. Distributed in a perfect linear fashion, they suggest the presence of an extremely powerful magnetic field during the formation of these circles. People within these formations report sensations that hint at the influence of electromagnetic radiation. While scientific inquiry has largely focused on the alterations in plant biology, and soil conditions, anecdotal evidence suggests a far-reaching influence, one that affects both man and machine. Let's consider an experiment that involved a woman with an enlarged thyroid. She spent two and a half hours in a crop circle, her condition being continuously monitored by medical professionals. Astonishingly, her thyroid shrank by 40% within that time frame. Are we looking at a fluke, or is there something about the energy within these crop circles that we don't yet understand? an energy potent enough to affect human physiology. But the mystery doesn't end with human health. Numerous reports cite electronic malfunctions within these mysterious patterns. Cameras fail, watches stop ticking, and other electronic devices become inoperable. Boy, those owls have been up to it this time. <laughs> Them owls, man, you. listen, they've gotten crafty. Yeah, Owls are the aliens, holy moly. It's not that aliens are owls. Owls are aliens. Owls are a thousand percent alien guaranteed. So there was a lot of info here. Oh yeah. A lot of info, but it all kind of fit together. That's why I piece it together yeah. this way. So the first thing is these nodes are not just like you said, they're the strongest part. They're exploding. Right. Yeah. A uh, microwave eruption or something like that. Yeah. So for anyone that, if you think about it, when you put something in a microwave, the way that you're heating it is you're vibrating the water inside of whatever it is. That's why if you have something that is dry or doesn't have water, the microwave doesn't work. Yeah. You can't heat something that doesn't have at least some form of water. If you bought some of that uh, space ice cream and you put it in a microwave, mm -hmm. nothing will happen. Nothing. Okay. So... The node is exploding and it's causing it to lay down. It's almost as though your knuckle's gone. Your fingers are just going to, right? the muscle's going to tense it down, right? But the other fascinating thing, they're finding traces of radiation. I wanted so badly, can't even begin to tell you guys how badly, there was a video. They took these people out to the crop circle and they're trying to figure out what's going on with the crop circle. They put their hand down and their hands is up and their hand looks normal. Like the palm of your hand, right. as it goes down, these little bubbles start forming, which is known as a form of radiation. Oh, that's not good. And then they bring it back up and their skin goes back to normal. Really? Yeah. There's a video. You go to YouTube, you type it in, you'll find it. Well, it'd have to be pretty, like, fairly strong radiation to affect someone's thyroid. It's not like they're laying their neck on the ground. Or 40% for two and a half hours, it was reduced. And she says stayed for four? <laughs> I know, or right? Six. She would have had a Thargoid. <laughs> Some, yeah. She would have had a Thargoid in there. None of them dogs Did you say Thargoid? thargoid? <laughs> I did. Because it was funny. Back to your elite danger. Their thyroid days. <laughs> dropped by 40%, though. That's significant. Oh, We're talking yeah. about aliens. I got to call them Thargoids, Nick. I got to. I'm sorry. <laughs> the only people who's going to get that is the people that play Elite Dangerous. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's fascinating. In the, uh, uh, so the, the, the people can tell there's a difference. Electronics fail. Um, Correct. Yeah, just about watches every, stop ticking. Yeah, watches stop ticking. That's like that's not even technically electronic. Electronic, the if they're wound watches, I suppose they wouldn't be. But I believe what's happening is the uh, magnetism of the right. area. Because one of the things that it mentioned, I don't know if you caught it or not, mm -hmm. uh, and we've not really covered it up to this point. No matter where they find the quote unquote right circles, 
Mm-hmm. They're finding a powder okay. that's on the crop. And that is... Uh, so they can identify this powder. They can. Okay. Particles consist of meteorite iron. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember that part. And it's distributed in a perfect linear fashion. They suggest the presence of... Yes. And they suggest the presence of an extremely powerful magnetic field during the formation of these circles. So... Okay. Well, that that would kind of fit in with the Bob Lazar stuff as well, would it not? That's exactly where I was going. Yeah. Because what they're saying is the radiation that's getting created is a electromagnetic radiation. Right. Um, Sort of side note I'm going to insert here. I was talking to my brother today, Mm -hmm. and we got Mm -hmm. on the topic of Bob Lazar, and he should Mm -hmm. have been here for that episode instead of me, because he could have given you a run (laughs) for for your money. Yeah. He knows a lot about Bob Lazar. It's crazy, isn't it? Now you oh, do yeah. too, Nick. You had it. Now I did. Yeah, I was able to talk about it uh, and sound intelligent. So I fooled him. <laughs> See, you probably shocked him. He wasn't ready for it, Nick. That's right. He wasn't ready. Now he thinks I'm an alien. <laughs> There's a lot with the Bob Lazar, and it all fits. It yeah. all fits. Yeah, it's sort of corroborating now, next- this story. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm, all these things. And I was telling Nick before we started our podcast. The reason I feel like my podcasts are so long is because I'm pulling from this story and this story and this story and this story and piecing it all together. What if I told you the next segment I could tie to ghosts? I believe it. Skeptical, but I believe you can do it. Or you can try. I think think that everything can be tied together within reason. Well, I know EMF, that's common mm-hmm. in ghosts, so yeah, I, I can see spider webs among these things. Well, even what's in the segment is not necessarily what I believe is there, okay. but I believe it plays into that and the Bob Lazar that we was just talking about. All right. And something else. But it's something to where no skeptic can ever say there's not something to this. It, okay. They just can't. This is a challenge, everyone. This is a challenge. This is a challenge. Are you ready for the thing that I that I I believe you cannot disprove? I am ready. But the story doesn't end there. In a significant twist, some formations seem to defy the very notion of impermanence. Known as ghost formations, these spectral remnants haunt the very fields where their original designs once lay. Imagine, if you will, farmers harvesting their crops, tilling the soil, and preparing the land for a new season, only to find that last year's mysterious designs have made a ghostly reappearance. Intriguingly, these ghost formations don't just appear in any field. They manifest in the same, exact locations where crop circles had been discovered in previous years. One can't help but wonder what lingering energy or residual traces are these ghost formations pointing to? Is the ground itself holding on to the memory of these unexplained designs, much like a haunting? Researchers have ventured into the realms of soil chemistry, looking for lasting changes that might account for these recurring phenomena. Others have contemplated the notion of residual energy, a mystifying force that could affect the crop growth for seasons to come. While science still grapples with these questions, one thing is certain, the ghost formations serve as a lasting echo, urging us to continue our search for answers. You're right. (laughs) It all ties in. Like we talk about ghosts all the time and we talk about residual energy. Like what is that? Like when you look at hauntings, there's a bunch of different hauntings. And one of my friends hit me up the other day and he's like, you need to create an episode explaining all this stuff because when you talk about it, I feel like I have no clue what you're talking about. (laughs) Different hauntings have different things. There's intelligent haunting, which means that Mm -hmm. these ghost or spirit or whatever it is acknowledges you and they can have a conversation with you. But there's a haunting called a residual haunting, which I think is the most common one is by far the most common. Yeah. What most People believe that believe on this stuff. We're going to call them the believers. Right. Okay. 
what they believe is that such a traumatic experience occurred that it almost locked in a looping fashion that memory to that location or item forever or as long as what they think. Right. Now, psychics don't believe that. Uh, Some do, actually. Some mediums believe that also because they say they can see both, both of the major types of hauntings. But in this case... For years to come, and they typically it's two to three seasons, so two to three right. years, they'll go to the same field and the spot where there was crops, they're having the same issues. Crops aren't growing. Okay, so I think there's something here. I'm going to mm-hmm. lean towards contamination. Could be. Uh, I'm not... While your other theory I find fascinating for hauntings and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. I would stick with contamination on this one, which is where I think I'm landing, as opposed to that, because I sort of put that in a different category where it has a more almost, I hate to use this term, like psychic effects, which I don't think you'd see in the middle of an empty field typically. So I'm going to think Let soil me ask contamination. A question. Mm-hmm. Let me ask a question just to extend your thought process. Okay. What happens to the crops when this occurs? They lay down. They continue growing though. That's impossible because you said it's contaminated. Hmm. Well, there are types of contamination that it occurs could, after. Absolutely. That could, that could mutate an existing crop but make Absolutely. it inhospitable for a young uh crop that's more susceptible to disease and harsh growing probably conditions similar, probably similar like chernobyl and stuff right yeah well, well i guess what i'm saying is that i can take and transplant a tree into soil that's mm-hmm. not very good and the tree will continue sure. to grow but but that same soil i can't grow a seed out of it So here's how I look at that. The, the, and again, we don't know what we're talking about from a, from a, we don't know what, what's truly being left there. Right. This is speculation on my part. They should be able to test for my theory. So maybe mine's wrong. Well, they, they find radiation is typically from that meteor, meteorite ore or iron. But there is traces of radiation that's occurring, which Mm. we know. But that type of radiation would not cause a year or two years later for crops not to grow. Right. What they're saying is someplace like Chernobyl Mm -hmm. that was devastated by radiation, there's still stuff growing there. I don't think it ever stopped, in fact. It never stopped. And that is literally a hot spot. Like there's places you cannot live and not die within even now. Like radiation is higher there now than what we can sustain for any length of time. Yeah. So my point being, unless it's something that we know nothing about. Right. Which I'm assuming if that was the case, when people was going into that field, they would have died. Right. But there's also other because forms of contamination too, other than radioactive contamination. That is true. So, that is true. But all speculation. The only thing that I was thinking from a ghost perspective, mm-hmm. residual creates, we don't know what residual is. We just think of it as in it's locking into an item or a ground or in the, the, whatever it is, the spirits repeating itself. Right. What if this was such a traumatic experience that it's locking itself into the land, which is causing that area not to grow. That was my thought process. Yeah. And and even though I'm not going down that route, I can think of some, anecdotal evidence to support that because we have stories of hauntings not of people but of machinery 
of animals, right. of even landscapes. Oh, for sure. It's so. almost like in a case of like this one, it's not not a hill that I would die on, right. but my brain has to at least include it as a thought process because yeah. later I'll tie it to something else and be like, oh, wait, that ties with that. Interesting. Yeah. And thinking to previous ghost stories, I can meet you part way on that. I'm not yeah. going that direction, but I'm also not saying it's not that. If, um, if someone said, what hill would you die on on this? Yeah. I would say there was something that happened to the ground that would cause it unsustainable to grow for two to three seasons. Yeah. That could even be as simple as the meteorite iron mm -hmm. that was evenly distributed. Yeah. No one talks about that. Evenly, they took crops from the inside of the circle and the outside of the circle, and it was the same levels. Right. And then as it got away from the circle, it dissipated. Yeah. So could it even be that? We don't know. Right. I, well, I think what we can both agree on, um, and again, I'm not disagreeing with your thing, but I think we can both agree that something's going on here. Oh, yeah. thousand percent. So that I thought was pretty interesting because it built a lot. Oh, yeah. There's an event that is going to tell us the future in the next segment. Okay. Do you, do you think this mm -hmm. next segment talking about the future is going to win me over or push me back? So it's a future that's happened. Oh, uh, okay. So if you don't lean back and go, wait, what? But right. it could just be something that, uh, that was just coincidental. Okay. Well, I, I want to know. I want to know what. <laughs> Here we go. Many crop circles appear over chalk aquifers, known to generate electricity, adds another layer to this unfolding mystery. What if the forces at play here are not just from this world, but also intimately tied to the earth itself? These aquifers and chalk hills are not just a canvas, but may be part of the equation itself. Southern England becomes not just a hotspot, but potentially a convergence point for these energies. The presence of ancient structures like Silbury Hill and Stonehenge, known for their historical and spiritual significance, only deepens the mystery. In 1996, a formation appeared near Stonehenge in the shape of a Julia set, a complex fractal pattern derived from mathematical equations. Could this be a universal language meant to communicate with us, or perhaps a coded message that we have yet to decipher. Then there are the ley lines, these hypothetical alignments of numerous places of geographical and historical interest, like ancient monuments and megaliths, natural ridge tops and water fords. The existence of these lines has long been debated, yet their connection with the crop formations near areas like Stonehenge and Aveberry can't be easily dismissed. Could they be channels of energy, or perhaps pathways leading us to some cosmic truth? Hold on to your seats, ladies and gentlemen, for what you're about to hear may defy your understanding of reality itself. In 2011, two similar double spiral crop formations were discovered, one at Windmill Hill and another near the iconic Stonehenge, separated only by mere miles. Dr. Jerry Croth postulates that these formations could represent nothing less than neutron stars, astrophysical behemoths that under rare circumstances collide to form a magnetor. For those unfamiliar, magnetors possess some of the strongest magnetic fields in the known universe, capable of bending the fabric of space-time itself. But here's where the story takes an almost unimaginable twist. The very day after these crop formations appeared, a new magnetor was discovered in our galaxy. It wasn't there before, and suddenly it was. Could it be mere coincidence? Or is something, or someone, trying to tell us about the deeply interlinked realities of our universe? I am fascinated about that. But... <laughs> it is a tenuous connection. And could be coincidence. Folder seven, and we skip folder four. It's just some dumb idiots that pole vaulted in. I don't want to see those guys. Later. Yeah, they're idiots. On seven, these are the circles that they found. Okay. Now, if you look, they're connected. So right. they're literally 
connected by one. So a spiral was made. Mm-hmm. And then the end of the spiral goes into another spiral. Right. I know you're saying they're coincidental. They were found at two major events. Or two major spots. Right. The one that I think most people would obviously know the the most, Mm -hmm. Stonehenge. Right. Right. They also found another one on Windmill Hill. Okay. I'm not familiar with Windmill Hill. Um, okay. It, it doesn't really improve the story, but. Okay. We have someone that looked at those two things and said, that is basically the equivalent by far of what I would look at as two neutron stars hitting. And we've seen that recently within the last five years. So we found an occasion where that happened five years ago. And what happens is the theory, this goes around to all you nerds out there. You're going to be like, yes, my boy coming in for me. (laughs) So when we talk about wormholes, right. The thought process is two neutron stars, whether they're white dwarfs, whatever they are, create such a magnetic pool that it can create what's known as a magnetar or a, basically you're, 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 I'm trying to think of an easier way to put it. You're bending space and time together Mm -hmm. to create a wormhole. Right. The very next day after these things were found, we found a brand new magnetar that we did not know existed the day after we found those two things that formed on the same day. So I think in the narrative, it said, Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I interpreted it wrong, that we know that there was nothing there before. Correct. And then there was. Correct. Did, could it have been there for some time and we discovered it the day after or it appeared the day after it's impossible is a thousand percent impossible to know. Okay. And the reason I say that is the, the sky is so vast. Right. And the different agencies are looking at different spots. So right. prime example, if you're looking at one star right, and you're zoomed all the way in and you're trying to figure out what's there, mm. the next star could be billions well, that's an exaggeration. They could be millions of light years away. Right. Just the next closest star. Well, also, we but can't monitor was, everything all the time anyway because of the impossible. rotation of the Earth and Correct. that. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So, it, it could be in the lag time. I, th- I think they said it's there's like a lag time of up to a year and a half or something like that. Probably. But, but that's all the still science impressive. People out there probably know. But the fact that we say, here's these two things that we found that match. They're exactly the right. same in two major areas. The very next day, our astrological survey team comes mm-hmm. out and goes, we just discovered this. Look at this. And it's coincidentally the same kind of thing. Right. That's, that's pretty now, persuasive. And that's where I'm coming from. Could be something, might be nothing. But what a coincidence if it just so happened. You know what I would do if I discovered the magnetar? What? I wouldn't tell anyone until I'd had time (laughs) to make crop circles. That would be genius. I'm not saying that happened. That's what an evil genius such as myself would do could just be uh, uh who knows it just could be you just you just never know it, it you could write a book after it for sure well actually it would be more <laughs> like this i discover something in space i look up what is a magnetar <laughs> <laughs> and then i look up how do i make a crop circle <laughs> that's genius that is an absolute genius nick that's what i would do too if i was you yeah. or me for that oh. much because Good thing we have I know Google. what a lot of this stuff is because I nerd out on it. Yeah. That's oh, fascinating. Man. 
What a coincidence. It really That's is. That's a crazy coincidence. I, you know where my mind was going, and I know this is too far, but... And, and again, I'm not saying this is anything that happened, but this thing appears, and I think mm-hmm. it appeared before them, and this thing facilitates people from far away to create these on the earth. It's like a gateway and they can create these and say, look, this is how we're doing this. So there's, uh, I don't know if I put this in the narration or not. I don't, I don't think so. The majority of the time they don't believe it's the UFO that's creating these. Right. It's an energy ball, multiple that's creating these. There was actually, and I didn't put it in the narration because it's later been debunked. We've Is this the we video figured out that it's completely it? fake. Uh, so there was a guy that was on this hill, and I can't remember what the name of the hill was, uh, but he went out and he videoed these balls of light coming down and creating a crop circle. Yeah, I saw that. And a lot of, much like, much like the people that bring up these guys and go, that's proof that these crop circles don't exist. Mm -hmm. many people still recite back to that guy and go, this is how we know crop circles exist. Here's how they're made. He later said how he did it. And it's all fake. Yeah. I didn't include in the narration because it's butt kissed. If it's not legit and I can prove that it's not legit, I don't put it in. But what he did, he created, he videoed a segment of a field, Mm -hmm. created another segment of a field that had a crop circle Combine the two together and then created balls of light mm-hmm. and then slowly merged the two images together. I, I got to say, I've seen that and I'd seen it quite some time ago. And for the time, it was an impressive video editing job. Very. For the, when that was created, it was stupid how yeah. A, it looked real. Had he not came out and told what he did, hmm. I don't know that they would have figured it out right away. Uh, You know, I don't think so. And I think for a long, I don't think anyone actually even tried that hard. I think a lot of people did accept that at the time. Well, the people who were going to accept it, it accepted it. And the people who weren't didn't. Oh, yeah. And they left it at that. Well, and that's the tough part, right? That's why I didn't include it in this. I could have included it and it would have made an amazing narration to the story, but it's not true. And I can't, I can't put something in that's not true. Yeah. People would have called us on that anyway, because everyone knew he came. You'd be surprised. Yeah. I've watched two videos recently created by Mm -hmm. bigger channels that has that in theirs and has it as the gospel. I'll tell you why. And the mad him. Sorry. Do what? I'll tell you why I wouldn't be surprised is because when Mm -hmm. we did the Jersey devil video, I showed you, you've seen that ridiculous video. Yeah, people are putting that in there as reality too, so. That blows my mind. But like in this case, the guy came out and said, this is how I created it, and then showed how he created it to the news. That would be like me saying, um, like, you know, my car caught on fire and then come back and go, yeah, it didn't really catch on fire. I just did some FX effects. (laughs) Then everyone go, man, I know his car caught on fire. I saw it. Yeah, for sure. The man that did it said how he did it. It's like, come on. Yeah. Um, There's another part that comes up next, which is super interesting. And it kind of goes back to another part that you talked about previous. Okay. We kind of hinted around it and then kind of moved away from it. I didn't put it all in the narration because I'm going to explain part of it at the end, but I think you're going to find this super interesting. It's going to go back to Bob Lazar. Okay. Fast forward to 2022, a new formation appears, thought to depict a wormhole, that cosmic shortcut through the very fabric of space and time. Are these formations puzzle pieces, clues leading us toward understanding an incomprehensible cosmic mystery? Now, enter Nikola Romansky, an electrical engineer who looked at various newer crop circles, but saw not random designs, but blueprints. Blueprints for a machine, one potentially running on the elusive zero-point energy and capable of altering gravity. With a team of experts and years of work, they built it. While the prototype didn't function as expected, who's to say that Nikola Romansky wasn't on the brink of something revolutionary? So this man, Mm -hmm. he's an engineer. He starts seeing all these crop circles. And at this point in time, they've changed significantly from 
the old circles that we see, right? Now right. we're getting faces of aliens out there. We start looking at these things and he goes, this looks like a diagram. This looks like a diagram to build something, almost like an instruction manual. Mm-hmm. So he gets all this money together and he gets this team together. And for, I think it was two and a half years, they're able to piece together a machine based on what these, what he said was blueprints. Okay. Now this is like contact. This is like, Oh, it is. Oh yeah. Spoilers. Oh yeah. No (laughs) clue. Never seen it. So no clue. They get it all the way built. They could not get it to work the way they intended. But what's interesting the machine was capable of creating plasma. Really? So it it did function to some degree. Correct. Hmm. Interesting. Now, one interesting thing, when we talk to Bob Lazar, he talks about how plasma is created mm-hmm. when these ships take off. Right. I was thinking that. Yes. So they got most of the so, way there. You know what I think they're missing? The element. Element 115. I bet if they had element 115, they could have got it off the ground. There's a full documentary on this. Uh, I forget what the name of the documentary was. Uh, I got it somewhere. I can put it in the description wherever it's at. But it's like an hour and a half, two hours of you basically watching them build this machine and how they did it. It, It's interesting. I picture there's a machine. You no picture this. They mm-hmm. built this machine. It works part of the way. They still maybe aren't mm-hmm. entirely sure what it does. The ones who designed it knew that we yeah. were on the verge of synthesizing this element. Right. So when we finally are capable of synthesizing this element, it's like a marker that extraterrestrials have put on us. It's a mile marker. We get this, we plug a canister into this machine, zap, we're part of the intergalactic community. Just like that. Correct. Can you imagine that? I, I, We've used this analogy before. It's like throwing a cell phone into a gorilla cage right. and seeing if they can figure out how to open the app. Eventually, they're going to figure out if they press a button, the, the screen lights up. Yeah. They keep messing with the screen. They're going to get into an app. Mm -hmm. The only reason they stopped working on this is because they ran out of money. Right. Go find me. How crazy is that? Come on. (laughs) Come find me. No, I'm I'm saying like open a GoFundMe if Star Citizen can get 14 bajigagillion dollars. Surely we can fund this. I'd throw in some cash. I, the documentary is super interesting. I actually watched it three weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks. It's been a while. I didn't get to pay a lot of attention to it because I was in the middle of other stuff too. But right. occasionally when I'd glance over and see what's happening, I'm like, wow. Was it a documentary on this? Yes. Oh. Them building this machine. Yeah. You've got to send me the title later. I want to watch that. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm I'm super interested in that. I'm more interested in the science of space than the mystery that it causes on Earth. Oh, here we go, Bob Lazar Jr. Good night. No, the difference is is I'm not getting angry when you say, hey, what's a crop circle? (laughs) And I'm like, how dare you ask me about a crop circle? (laughs) You son of a gun, I'll hit you. (laughs) Sorry, Bob. That's my impression of you. Poor Bob. (laughs) Bob's sitting over here like, these sons of guns. No, no, no. Bob, the, most of the time you seem really friendly, but sometimes not friendly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I So those are the key takeaway and parts to this story. There's one segment that I want to end it on, and we're going to have a huge discussion after it, I okay. know. Because I don't know if you knew this or not, Governments got together to try to prove aliens existed 
And the way that we know so much about it was we released the information relatively recently about it. Are these those conferences that were happening or are we talking about something else? No. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. It was actually called Operation Blackbird. Uh, okay. Have you read that? I have not. It's really interesting uh, because it happened in the early 1980s. And, uh, yeah. I wasn't aware at that time, I don't think, enough to. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they brought out the bits and pieces of it, I want to say in 2005, 2010, 15, something like that. I was slightly more aware in that time. (laughs) Yeah, slightly more aware. I want you to listen to this part and I want you to, to think through this, Nick, okay. and go, hmm, because at the end we're going to have one heck of a conversation. All right, lay it on me. But the story of crop circles would be incomplete without discussing the monumental contributions of Colin Andrews, a name that's virtually synonymous with crop circle research. If you were to sketch out a Mount Rushmore of crop circle investigators, his face would undoubtedly be carved into it. Andrews' work commenced in the early 1980s, when crop circles were barely blips on the mainstream radar, equipped with nothing but raw curiosity and the emerging technology of the time. He set out to catalog, study, and interpret these awe-inspiring phenomena, whether it's meticulously mapping out locations, attempting to decode the intricate geometric designs, or analyzing soil and crop samples, Andrews has done it all. It was Colin Andrews who brought credibility to a field shrouded in skepticism. His methodical approach helped separate the wheat differentiating authentic formations from man-made hoaxes, but what has been most remarkable is his willingness to venture into the unknown to pose questions that dare to intersect science, spirituality, and even extraterrestrial hypotheses. Operation Blackbird began in the summer of 1990. Led by crop circle researchers Colin Andrews and Pat Delgado, the project sought to capture crop circle formation on film. What stood out was the partnership with major media outlets, including the BBC and Japanese National Television. Even the British Ministry of Defense provided land for the operation. Surveillance was intense, featuring state-of-the-art equipment like night vision and infrared cameras. The area was secured to prevent any intrusion and preserve the integrity of the site. But then, things took a twist. Just on the second day, a crop circle appeared. The excitement was palpable, but it quickly turned into public humiliation. The circle was a hoax, a clumsy imitation featuring an astrology board game. This episode severely compromised the credibility of the field of crop circle research, and the operation became a subject of ridicule. Alright, starting at the end, I was not clear how under all this surveillance did a hoax appear. So for anyone that did not grasp some part of that, mm-hmm. maybe you guys zoned out in a part. The MOD, as well as the BBC, mm-hmm. let's 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 back up a little bit. Right. The MOD, the 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 Ministry of Defense. Yeah. They say, we're going to prove that there's extraterrestrial life that's creating these crop circles because now they're becoming so prevalent. Right. We're going to prove it right here. And how are we going to do that? We're going to bring in the guy that knows the most about it. He's done everything on it. On top of that, we're going to have a news crew Mm -hmm. that's going to be recording this every single day. We're going to talk about it every single day. We're going to acknowledge the fact that these are true every single day. The military cordons off the entire area to where no one can get in, no one can get out. Right. If you go back to this film footage, the first day, all they do on the BBC is talk about, this is what we're doing. Here's how we got it set up. Here's the way we're going to run this. We've got these infrared cameras, which was cutting edge. Right. We've got cameras all over the place. We're going to capture these balls of light coming down, creating these crop circles. Mm. On day two, they pull Colin Andrews and they go, sir, we have a crop circle. Okay. Colin Andrews, because the film crew is there. They're ready. 
He's getting the information. He comes out and he goes, we have exciting news. We finally have a crop circle. We clearly must have witnessed this. We have cameras all over the place. They go out to the circle. Mm -hmm. They're excited because this this is a circle. It's in the middle of nowhere. No one's there. Right. It's been cornered off. It's been watched the whole time. The whole entire time. Right. In the middle of the crop circle is an astrology board game. Okay, that was the part that was confusing. A literal astrology board game. Yes. Wow. Colin Andrews is then ridiculed and made fun of. There's a hypothesis. There was a series of crop circles that were found five miles from this location that were mm-hmm. deemed authentic. Okay. The theory is because crop circles was taking so much interest, the governments didn't want people to acknowledge them. So they set up this whole charade. The military was guarding the entire thing. There was no way that someone got in or got out without the military knowing. Right. Right. On top of that, the cameras that was watching that area mysteriously did not work. Right. And someone placed an astrology board game there. But because they had the best person that's the most renowned, they turned him into a laughing stock. And then the concept of crop formations dissipated. No one was interested anymore. Mm. Don't you just love the literal millions of dollars of tax money that went in to make fool, a fool of a guy? Like, correct. That is unreasonable. But if, you, if you think about it, though, look at the story of Bob Lazar. Yeah. What did they do? They discredited the man. Right. Discredited him heavy. Yeah. Whether you believe it or not. They made him disappear. Mm-hmm. He didn't exist. The The easiest way, and we talk about it even now, the easiest way to get rid of someone is not to kill them. Mm-hmm. It's to discredit them and make them look like a fool to their peers. Right. And apparently they went way overboard with Bob Lazar. They could have just pulled a stupid oh, yeah. prank on him. And right. people would have lost all faith. Like that, Correct. that story seems so... It's really telling about how humans are. Oh, yeah. Like, when I hear that story, I'm like, what a bunch of jerks. That doesn't mean anything about crop circles. Right. Although I feel like from the get-go, it seemed like kind of a setup. Because they're like, here's this field. How do you know where that crop circle is going to appear? Like, this was a setup from day one. Correct. That would be my hypothesis. If someone asked me, that would be the first thing. Because here's the thing. When he went on the media and said, Mm -hmm. we found a crop circle, he hadn't seen it. He hadn't been there. I'd like to know who told him. him. Well, supposedly, it was people from the government that had acknowledged to him. Hey, guess what? You did it. You found a crop circle. So he's on the news, BBC talking, Mm -hmm. we found it. We now have proof. It's definitive. And why wouldn't he say that? Why wouldn't he? Correct. I mean, this was a cordoned off area. No one could get in. No one could get out. If you're him, why would you think anything? And on top of this, the government brought you in. You think the government's on your side. Right. And they've spent literal millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. To do a stupid little prank on you. That wouldn't even cross my mind. I would have fell for the same thing. Exactly. So he has said since then, he believes, and many people that believe in this, 100% believe that we got too close to the to the truth. Right. The government wanted to keep this kind of a secret, so the easiest way to make it go away is to bury it. Yeah. And how do you do that? You go to the guy that, like it said, had did it all, and you make him look like a fool. Yeah. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy nut or anything, but I've seen this time and time again, not even with supernatural paranormal stuff. But if you think that a government won't ruin an individual, 
oh, think the twice. Good of them, because they will for sure. Like if you forgot to fill out a form on your taxes, don't don't <laughs> think they're not going to come and destroy you. So that is fact. <laughs> Well, Nick, we're at the end of this thing. Where would you, when we started, you thought this was was a bunch of hooey. I did. And I'm going to use the excuse that I was never presented the proper information. Um, And really, I've not watched any. You need old Bert to bring you info. Yeah, that's right. I did. Um, I, there's, uh, like I said, a lot of times, there's something here. Um, Something here. Don't know what it is. Even I don't know what it is. No. But there's, but there's here. too many things that make me scratch my head going, I don't know what that is, and I don't understand why that would be unless there's something there. You really won me over when you brought Carl Sagan and the Silicon Lifeform information sheet there. That's when you won me over. You could have stopped right there, and you had me then. <laughs> uh, and I know there's hoaxes. No matter what we talk about, there's going to be 98% hoaxes. But 2% of something real is all you need. Correct. And again, this is why they have a list of these are things that we see that makes us believe this is real. Right. When it's not damaged, when there's the ghost formations that occur after, when the crop is still producing. The one thing that I didn't mention when it talked about the wheat, you remember how I said there's one thing that happens? It wasn't in there. A very interesting thing that happens is when it's wheat and, you know, the, the top of it starts to droop, Mm -hmm. droop. Yeah. You can literally go like this and it'll shake around. It's like, it's just so heavy. Yeah. In crop circles, when it's wheat, they become firm again. Right. And they continue growing. they remain firm. Horizontally. Yeah. But even when they're growing, they're three quarters of the way through the life, it droops. Yeah. But when the crop circle comes back through, it stiffens back out as though it's a young crop again. Okay. Yeah, the the bending at the at the node is uh is a big thing too. Um and if anyone oh, ever drives sure. by a wheat field, go out there and even just with your fingers, try to bend it at the node. It's oh, not yeah. gonna happen. Good it's luck. gonna break, You're gonna or break nothing. it everywhere but the node. That's right. It's the toughest Correct. part. So there's something here. Well, everybody, hopefully, just like this one, just like Nick, you enjoyed this episode. I wanted to go in deep with the crop circle things. I wasn't going to go into it until we talked last week on Nick's subject that I can't pronounce. The at love pass uh, incident. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was super interesting to me. I it's one of it was one of six things that I've got going right now. I'm researching five more. One of them's a banger because it's in Nick's backyard. So I'm super curious when we get to that one. Literally right out there right now. No, just right out there right now. You don't even know, Nick. No, I don't know. <laughs> but the biggest thing is no matter where you're listening to us at on this, please be sure to rate us. Let people know about us. Listen, I wouldn't be upset if you shared our podcast with mm-hmm. others either. So <laughs> please do. <laughs> And it's been happening. Thank you for everyone that's been doing it so yeah. far. We definitely appreciate that. What do you think, Nick? Do you got any last words on this one? Uh, yeah. One thing I want to say. Doug Bauer, Dave Chorley, you are bad people. <laughs> <laughs> You're Fair ruining enough. it for all of until us. We see, until you see us in the next one. Goodbye. See you later. <laughs>